Hey everybody, welcome to LettermanRow.com. I am Jeremy Birmingham and this is Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast brought to you by Buyers Auto. If you're looking for an auto, go to BuyersAuto.com and find the best selection of new and used vehicles in central Ohio and around the state. If you're looking for Ohio State football stuff, you've come to the right spot. I'm going to talk with Zach Carpenter about the latest in Buckeyes football recruiting. Let's get to it. Zach. Uh, the Buckeyes are back on the road, man. The, the recruiting trail is picking up for Ohio State now that the full complement of Ohio State coaches are available. New coaches, as we've talked about a number of times on Letterman Row in the last couple of weeks, but now is the first week that Jim Knowles, um, uh, Perry Aliano, Tim Walton are all available to be on the road. And, um, you know, we saw on Tuesday the first offer from Jim Knowles himself, go out to Tackett Curtis, four-star linebacker in Louisiana. I know you talked to Tackett. How did he respond to Jim Knowles, in your opinion? Um, yeah, a lot of comfort and familiarity there. I, I think there's a lot of mutual respect between the Curtis family and the and Jim Knowles. Uh, Tackett Curtis's dad is also his coach at, down in Louisiana. And it, there, there's respect there with Knowles' knowledge of the game and just sort of his, his nature. He's no-nonsense. Uh, no BS type of guy. I think Tackett said he's he's aggressive, knowledgeable. You could tell like he holds your interests and he, he holds you accountable is something that Tackett said. I, I'm really interested to see over these next few weeks when I, I know I'm sure Jim Knowles won't be extending a lot of offers necessarily, but there'll probably be one or two. And we're going to start to learn a little bit more about him, I think. I mean, I, I know that he he's like known as the mad scientist or whatever uh, when he when he devises his defensive game plans, he like locks himself in his office or whatever and doesn't emerge for like 48 hours or something like that. Um, I, I'm from my point of view, I'm more interested to see what what the recruits think of him. I mean, it, he doesn't seem like he's not like a Kerry Combs, like high energy, like uh, razzle dazzle guy. He seems very like composed and business like. Is that sort of the sense that you got that you got? It, yeah, about? I mean, I don't I don't think that we fans and I wrote about this on Tuesday at Letterman Row. I don't think fans should be expecting him to be a big dynamic personality. But the truth of the matter is what matters for recruits is how well the Buckeyes defense plays. And I think as long as Jim Knowles is able to communicate his vision for the defense uh, and then still be able to go out there and connect with some kids. And I think that's what you're going to see this week and next as he's out on the road for Ohio State you're not going to see many instances like this where he goes out and gets his guy because Tackett Curtis is a player he was recruiting at Oklahoma State. Uh, Al Washington was recruiting him very, very on the periphery. Um, you know, I've been talking to him. I wrote about Tackett Curtis for the first time last May. So it's not – I mean, there had been some discussion, but he hadn't visited Ohio State because Al really wanted him to visit before an offer came. And so since Jim, Jim Knowles already knew him, he felt more comfortable giving him the offer. And now Tackett told me that he was definitely going to, you know, find a way to get up to Ohio State for a visit. Uh, I know on Tuesday he also saw Jaden Osbury in LSU, uh, in Louisiana, uh, and then he's supposed to see Troy Bulls this week. So, it's, you know, we'll see if he goes out and sees Tamir Robinson up in Pittsburgh and really just kind of get a sense of whether or not he's going to go out and, and find his guys or if he's going to touch base almost exclusively with the guys that Ohio State's been recruiting. And ultimately, Zach, I think that's the, the real – big question about all of these new assistant coaches because none of them uh, have really been recruiting at an Ohio State level, right? So Perry Eliano's done a great job as a recruiter at Cincinnati, but it's not, it's not Ohio State. Jim Knowles at Oklahoma State is not recruiting Ohio State level players. Tim Walton has been uh, off in the NFL for the last 14 years. Justin Fry has been recruiting at UCLA and on the West Coast and kind of looking for under the radar guys. So I'm, I'm curious really to see how quickly it takes uh, or how, how long it takes for these guys to begin evaluating and offering their own guys versus the Mark Pantone and the Ohio State recruiting staff saying, these are the guys we think you should go after, start with them first. And, and I think that's going to be one of the more fascinating subplots of these next few weeks. Yeah, I think that's probably going to come with some uh, maybe a delay or something because they need to kind of get caught up to speed with with who the guys that Pantone and Day, who, who they've kind of, evaluate as being the top guys because Ohio State, they, they have such a, uh, an analytical um, a approach to this where they, from Pantone down, they have uh, they already have their guys that um, they've evaluated for months, years. I mean, I remember the, the Kerry Combs story where he said he was talking to Pantone. I think you know what story I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Where he's like, this guy, Kerry's like, this guy isn't any good. And Pantone's like, 
carry. He's like 15. Like you yeah. got to give him time. So well, Tim Walton, I mean, like I said, that that's the interesting thing. He's been in the NFL for 14 years. If he's gonna come in and look at Ohio State cornerbacks prospects, he's gonna see the same thing. And I, I think there has to be some trust uh established quickly with the Ohio State recruiting staff to know, hey, this is someone I can go after. Yeah, and I think they're obviously they hired Perry Eliano, Tim Walton, Justin Fry, these guys, because they they have a proven track record that uh, or maybe not Tim Walton necessarily, but Perry Eliano, for instance, he he has a proven track record of developing three star, four star guys into into top tier talent. I mean, look what he did with Sauce Gardner, um, turning him into a future first round pick, and Kobe Bryant, Thorpe Award winner. Um, and now, what what's so interesting is now he has that track record of developing those guys. Now he's going to get Ohio State caliber talent, just like Jim Knowles is going to get. He proved that he can develop the three star under the radar talent at Oklahoma State, and now he's going to get a chance to do that with, with Ohio state caliber players right out of the gate. So they're going to, they're going to have this new influx of talent. And I, I think I don't want to like use the phrase sky is the limit, but it kind of is at this point, if they have, if they already have that proven track record. Yeah. You just have to go out and do it and you have to be comfortable, you know, on the road. And, and that's really what this is about from now until the 29th of January is where do you go? How many people do you see? How do you prioritize player A versus player B. I mean, uh, today it's Wednesday morning, Ryan Day and Tony Alford, uh, I believe are are seeing Richard Young this morning, you know, so you know that there's some guys, things aren't changing. Um, there are going to be other instances where Justin Fry is going to have to evaluate offensive linemen and tell Ryan Day, hey, you guys have been recruiting this guy. I'm not really that high on him or vice versa. And so I think that those are the interesting conversations that will really help get a sense of where Ohio State recruiting goes in these next two, three months. And because you bring that up, I it was interesting listening to your interview with Christian Gray. It's like, yeah, Perry Eliano, Tim Walton haven't really been in contact with them. So that's sort of point, I mean, example A of, of yeah. what you're talking about is Christian Gray is a guy who talked with Kerry Combs pretty much every day, every other day for the last four, five, six months. And now he hasn't been in contact with uh with the Ohio State coaches. I know like you you had mentioned Tim Walton still needs to kind of go through the the process of getting cleared by the NCAA to to be able to get on the recruiting trail. But he's just he's a perfect example of uh I, I mean we know AJ Harris. We know AJ Harris is the number one cornerback target. That's going to be there no matter what. But when you look at guys like Christian Gray, Malik Muhammad, Ethan Nation, guys on down the line, like what do, what do the new coaches think of them? Are they going to come in and say like, I see what I, I see the same evaluation you see, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's January 19th and I, I you know, we have 11 months until the, the next, you know, the, the first signing period of the, uh, the 2023 class and Ohio state is sitting with three commitments and there's a lot of things that can change between now and then. And I don't even think that it's necessarily uh, a situation where any any player has to move up or down. It's just right now I, there are a lot of positions where it's sort of starting from scratch. Um, you know, we've watched over the last few days just the way things have evolved. I mean, Luke Montgomery is now telling people that he is he's set in his mind. He's going to play the offensive line in college, and now he's ready to move forward in that path. And that happens because Mike Elston, the Notre Dame defensive line coach, the only coach in the country who was recruiting him to play defensive line, is now at Michigan. And apparently he doesn't have the sway at Michigan to win that battle, I guess, because if Mike Elston thought Luke Montgomery was a defensive lineman, I don't know why it all of a sudden changes because he's at Michigan, but say la vie, I guess, uh, you know, it, it, there's so many of these moving parts. AJ Harris is a prime example of that. We don't know what, what Tim Walton and Barry Eliano might think of him at this point. I know we know what Kerry Combs thought of him. Uh, I know that Ryan Day is a big fan of, of AJ and his family, but at the same time, it, Ryan Day's not the guy coaching these guys. So that th this is where you start to wonder. Rankings kind of go out the window. P PR wins like, hey, winning a big recruiting battle in the South because of the transfer portal, because of everything else, kind of goes out the window. Rankings kind of go out the window at this point, and it's all about pure football evaluations. And I think that's what Ohio State really did more than anything, Zach, in this new hiring spree of, of, of coaches. They went out and got football coaches first, whereas in 2019, Ryan Day's focus i think was to find dynamic recruiters who could help sell a vision and now it has to be about finding football guys yeah and two things they, uh going off that point i think you've said this in the past or like on a recent podcast maybe it was Lerman live where 
those dynamic recruiters, the, the O, the block O on the chest does a lot of the recruiting for you. And then yeah. adding a dynamic recruiter like Kerry Combs or uh, what have you is obviously a big boost for the program. But when you have now, when you have now, like you said, football coaches, not guys who are known for the X's and O's and uh, development and not just having that big personality, I think that that's going to do that, that's going to do just as well for Ohio State, but in a different way, because now you have the proven track record of they they know how to run a defense. They know how to run a position group and teach these guys different fundamental techniques. So now uh, now just going forward, I guess they kind of have a double edged sword there in, in terms of being able to kind of bring both to the table. But also uh, something I wanted to touch on was. Ryan Day and this staff always talk about personality fits. They want to get to know a guy for like six months before they even offer sometimes and Mm -hmm. uh, or like a year before they take their commitment. And a lot of times it's, is he a personality fit at Ohio State? Is he going to, I know Ryan Day said it like, I mean, four or five times in press conferences. Like we don't want a guy, we want to make sure that when the going gets tough, when adversity hits that they're not just going to run to the transfer portal after a year, after two years. We want to make sure that, they're in this for the long haul. And you talk about the football evaluation is huge for these new coaches uh, in the, in the um, recruiting world with the, with the guys they're targeting, but personality fit is too. They need to find out is my, is my personality and my coaching style a fit for AJ Harris or Christian Gray and uh, Luke Montgomery. It, that, that that's just as important of a, in this process as, as that actual film evaluation. I think you yeah. probably agree with that. I think it may be more important at this point because you've seen, I mean, Ohio state, it, it's interesting in the way that I, I people out there may or, or disagree or agree, whatever. I, mean, I, I feel like Ryan day has realized that Nick Saban loses his offensive coordinator and his position coaches every year, essentially. And it doesn't matter if they're big dynamic recruiters, Alabama national championships development, uh, that Nick Saban sells the program, no matter what. And Ohio State is the same way. Ohio State can be the same way. Ryan Day, Buckeyes winning championships, getting to the playoff, making sure that they're in that conversation every year, developing players for the NFL, that is more important than recruiting stars. Now, obviously, the more you do those other things, the easier it is to re- bring in the recruiting stars, right? So it's kind of a uh, you know chicken and the egg situation. But I think if you look back over the last couple of years, there have been obviously these big, splashy recruiting hires. The Al Washington hire is one of them. Kerry Combs, obviously a great developer of cornerback talent, but wasn't a proven defense coordinator, but you knew what he could do as a recruiter. You take those guys and then you hope that the football side of it just magically happens because you have good players. And that's just not really what's happening anymore because so many guys are leaving when they, you know, when they get this first sign of adversity. So the transfer portal has changed things in a way that I don't think anyone really understands um, what the, these coaches are dealing with. So there is a, a thought like, hey, we have to find guys that we know are going to be mentally tough enough to, to fight through, you know, a year or two of sitting, a year or two of development. And I do want to mention that they brought in these dynamic recruiters and I mean, it worked, right? I mean, they had sure. the, uh, the highest ranked recruiting class in Ohio State history in the 21 class. And then the 2022 class is going to finish as uh, the number four ranked class. So it's not as if that strategy didn't work, you know? So I don't want to like, I don't want to say that was a bad. No, it clearly worked. It was. And one of the most important things for him in his first few years was continuing to bring in the talent and continue to make sure that Ohio state was that brand, that, that national brand that, that urban Meyer kind of started back in 2012. Right. And now I think there is an understanding that it, that has continued And so now you can tweak it in the way that maybe best suits what Ryan Day wants uh, on his staff and what he wants in in the players on the team. And, you know, we're here to talk about individual football players and and recruits and that kind of stuff. But uh, I think it is important to look at the big picture of what Ohio State's doing and how each of these kids, um, you know, could change. We, we, we've we talked about the same kids over and over already for the last few months, the Richard Youngs, uh, the Carnell Tates, the, the A.J. Harris's, the Caleb Downs and Joel, uh, you know, uh, Jonel Aguero and those types of guys. But now Ohio State's get, got four new coaches uh, on defense or on offense and defense combined. And these guys are going to have to make some decisions. And then you have Larry Johnson, who's still out plugging away. He'll have A.J. Hoffler from Georgia 
uh, visiting this weekend, a four-star defensive end in the class of 2023 who's told anyone who will listen that Ohio State is his top school and that they're the team to beat. Let's just talk about that for a second, Zach, here on Talking Stuff, presented by Byers Auto. Do you think A.J. Hoffer is going to commit this weekend? He told me he's not going to. But do you think he's telling the truth? I'm always going to err on the side of no, the player's not committing because they always, they're kids and they always, no, I, I, whether they say that he's not committing, then he'll flip and say yes and vice versa. So uh, I, but the last time I did predict a commitment to happen was at the Bull Predictions podcast before the Michigan game. And I was right about that one. I was wrong about every other thing I said on that yeah. podcast, but I got that one right because Devin Brown committed a few days later even though it wasn't on the back of a Michigan win, which is, or a Ohio state win, which is what I thought was going to happen. But no, I, I, I guess he could, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to predict a commitment from AJ Hoffler just because that's uh, that's a dangerous road to go down. You know that. What, what do you think? Let me, I'm just, I was just trying to put you on the spot. No, I mean, I, I he says he's not going to, I believe him. Um, I think that he, you know, AJ and I wrote about this on Tuesday was that this visits about his mom getting a chance to see Columbus when he came up for the Michigan state game in 20 in uh, November, he was blown away by everything at Ohio State, left saying the Buckeyes were the leader, got his offer that he wanted, uh, says the Buckeyes are still the leader, despite the fact that he visited Georgia last weekend. He went to Michigan for the Ohio State-Michigan game. It's, you know, that's the type of kid you want to build around, six foot four, 250-pound defensive end, really smart kid, you know, big-time personality kid that, to Ryan Day's point over and over, we they want kids that want to be Buckeyes. Um, A.J. Hoffer seems like a kid who wants to be a Buckeye, now we'll see how long it takes for him to to be comfortable enough to say I'm ready. Um, another name that I think could offer this could get an offer this weekend is we're just going to bounce around here if he ends up making a visit to Ohio State, as he told me on Wednesday morning he may is Malik Hartford from um, Lakota um, down there. You know the teammate of Jair Brown and, and uh, Tiger Shabola. Um, at Lakota West, I think that he he's talking about visiting Ohio State this weekend. He was a top target for Perry Eliano at Cincinnati. Uh, Malik Hartford is an Ohio State caliber player, one of the kids in the state that people haven't talked much about because he didn't have a Buckeyes offer yet. But I wouldn't be surprised if he gets one this week. Yeah, and he's a guy that I I really want to see play in person. I've I've been over to Lakota twice um, for practices to see. Jair and Tegra on both days that I was there, Malik wasn't there. So I haven't really gotten the chance to evaluate him in person. I mean, um, and, and that's one of the biggest things is I always want to be able to see a guy in person if I can, especially obviously the Ohio and the Midwest guys before sure. I kind of give my, give my take on them. Um, I, I want to transition to something I just thought of, like, just kind of a question that popped in my head because we talked about in the 22 cycle how it took so long for – guys to make a decision because they're being very deliberate in their process, kind of seeing how the coaching care itself shaped out, get their visits in, uh, do all these things. And we kind of thought that would be a one-off. And, but now we're also talking about the new coaching staff for Ohio state, how it might take a while for them to get to know these players football wise and off the field. So do you get the sense that maybe in this 23 class, it's going to be another where it kind of takes a long time for this, this class to get filled out because there are so many different, changes and uh, moving parts in the program right now? I mean, there's a couple different dynamics at play here. And obviously you have, as you just mentioned, all the new coaches at Ohio State. And so there are some relationships that are going to take time to be built. But there's also what looks to be a fairly crushing impact on high school players with the transfer portal. Uh, and I think a lot of kids maybe are going to be taught or told, um, hey, if you know where you want to go, Make get your spot early because you don't know how many spots are going to be left because the way the portal is, is working. Uh, and, you know, if you're a college coach and you have to decide between a kid who's played three years in college or a kid who's just coming out of high school, I think generally speaking, you're going to take the kid who's played three years of college ball. So um, I think you will see some kids maybe try to hurry things up. Now, that said, there's that top 50, top 75 player group in the country that will always have a spot no matter what. And so you, you definitely, I don't think you'll see those kids speed up, but I do think that what Ohio state can do to mitigate that in some ways is players like Malik Hartford. Um, you know, if, if you know that this is a kid who you're going to offer in June, you probably should just offer now. Uh, because, because we saw that play out with um, not Blake Miller. Uh, oh no. The, now the name's escaping me. Where, uh, where with Emil Wagner, right. um, where it took, 
they took probably a little too long to offer him. And then by that time, it felt like the relationship was a little, um, uh, not severed. It was a little hurt though, um, uh, because of how long, long they took. No, I mean, and I think that that's the thing. Like, if you know that you're going to offer that kid, like, and I think that you probably will offer that kid, why not just offer him now? Let the relationship with Perry see again. This is a, a, a way Ohio State can win two times, right? You let Perry Eliano, who's a new coach, come in, offer a guy he knows and trusts and likes. So it teaches him, it shows him that Ryan Day has some confidence in what he's doing. Uh, and it also, probably lands you an in-state commitment pretty quickly a guy that you can build a class around a guy who isn't necessarily going to scare off players around the country because they're going to look at him and say oh it's you know he's an ohio kid whatever Uh, but people don't think ohio kids can play football for some reason which is obviously wrong um you know I, i think that that's really the the challenge here for ohio state is how how do you do that if you know that i'm going to offer this guy um five months from now well, Ryan Day did that pretty famously two years ago with Jacob James, Trey LaRue. Um, you know, he, he offered them earlier than a lot of people thought he would. Um, and, and then that led to an early commitment. And, you know, whether or not those guys panned out the way people have hoped or wanted, they did make an early commitment, stick in the class, build some camaraderie in the class. And now they're valuable on, on the back end of the roster as far as depth. So um, I think that you will see maybe some early offers going out that way. Yeah, and I'm not as familiar with the recruitment recruitments of Jacob James Trey LaRue because I was they were already committed by the time I started covering Ohio State. But I there's like reading back, hearing an uh, analysis of those type of recruitments in Day's first few months on the trail, it felt like he was really trying to sort of um he was trying to make sure that Ohio was locked down in his first cycle because I think when he visited guys like Jack Sawyer first, that he was trying to sort of um, leave an impression on high school coaches, families, and uh, players in this state that they were going to, they were going to make sure that Ohio was sort of prioritized. And maybe, maybe we wind up seeing these new assistants do something, something similar as they sort of get their bearings in Columbus. I mean, Harry Eliano doesn't really need to get his bearings as much. He's already very familiar with Ohio and the state. I'm sure guys like uh, Bryce West are going to be, going to be on his uh, radar and do, he's probably already hitting a film evaluations and kind of getting to know, getting to know that family as, as we speak and getting to know that coaching staff, because I wonder if that Glenville pipeline, like you mentioned, is something that could sort of get reopened here as, um, as they, as they uh, get more familiar with, uh, with around the country. But, yeah. I mean, um, and Ryan Day was at Glenville on Tuesday and, you know, we saw Ohio state, offer will smith jr this week as well so like there there are things happening in the state so now if you look at a 2023 recruiting class that sort of starts in ohio if you can get luke montgomery wrapped up if you can get josh padilla and austin saraveld and will smith and malik hartford uh you know maybe will Charles hartson who brian uh, hartline saw last week as your as your second running back because i think it seems pretty clear the buckeyes are going to probably end up taking two at that position uh, there is an opportunity for you to really get a, a solid base inside of the state of Ohio and and start from there. And then whatever happens down the road with Anthony Brown and other guys like that, if someone else you know develops, now you have some some players that you can build around uh, as the nucleus of your class. Yeah, and that's exactly what the strategy that was in the twenty one class and the twenty twenty two class. I mean, it started with in twenty one. It was Jack Sawyer, Ben Christmas, Ben. Chrisman, Reed Carrico, and uh, Jaden Ballard. And then the 22 class was four straight Ohio commitments too. It was Tegger, uh, Jair Brown, Tegger Shabola, CJ Hicks, and Gabe Powers. And the 23 class so far has only one Ohioan in it, it's Josh Padilla. But those names you just mentioned, they would love for that to be the nucleus of the class. And then the 24 class going forward, they do want that. They Ohio State is obviously a national brand, but they're always going to want to ideally – start off with a three, four man nucleus of, of in-state kids, just because, I mean, you got, you and Spencer have talked about this in the past, like obviously peer recruiting is as important as, as, as it's ever been, probably more important in this day and age with social media and how those kids are able to connect. But mm-hmm. we have guys an hour, hour and a half away who can come and visit campus anytime. Whenever you guys have, whenever you get guys in from Florida or Texas or California, you want three or four Ohioans if, if possible to, um, 
to sort of be there to make them comfortable with a new state and a new environment. And those guys have been talking to these recruits for months on end. So you already had the built-in relationships there. So this class should be a, a fairly large class for Ohio State. This should be in the 25, 26 range, I'd imagine. So if you can if you can pencil in a third of that from Ohio, and there, I wrote about Jermaine Matthews at Cincinnati Winton Woods on Monday as well. He's a young guy that uh, you know Ryan Day saw last week and was very impressed by. Doesn't have an offer from Ohio State yet. Does have eight or nine other offers around the country. He's a player that is going to be worth watching as well. So when once you throw that in, you really do get a sense that this class, as it unfolds, could be a little bit more centrally focused because Ohio State is is letting these new coaches get comfortable uh, and then just trying to build some some guys that are going to stick around the program for a while. And and you do get a sense that it's easier to convince kids from Ohio, hey, you don't need to transfer yet. Like, you don't need to move out. You don't need to, to do all this yet. And uh, it helps that these kids are all really good football players also. And that's, that's really the bottom line. So um, that's where I'm thinking Ohio State in 2023 really makes an early mark over these next two months. And then you allow yourself to focus more nationally as the spring rolls around and as summer rolls around and you start to host official visitors from around the country. So um, what else are we going to talk about? What other stuff? Oh, Omari Abor. I guess that's probably something we should talk about. You look like you had something else percolating. What is it? Uh, you know what? Yeah, let's let's finish the show on this. We haven't played in and out, in or out in a long time. So that's perfectly as a perfect segue into Omari Abor because – he is in right now, but he's not officially in. So, boom, Amari Abor, in or out, Berm? Uh, I'm going to say in. I mean, here we are again. It's January 19th. Uh, as of today, he's been telling Ohio State all the right things. He's not uh, He's not telling them that he's taking other visits. He's not telling him he's not. He's just said he's not planning on taking other trips. Uh, we'll see if that holds true. I mean, you know, he did tell people two days before he committed he was going to take visits after he committed – uh, and Texas and Florida were the names we heard. To this juncture, those haven't been scheduled. Those haven't been taken. I can't help but think there's going to be a last-second trip scheduled to Austin next weekend just as a let-me-make-sure type of thing. Um, but, again, you want to take a kid at his word, so I'm going to say Omari is in at this point. And I'm sure Ohio State will be sweating out that visit, too, as you would since he can't visit, he can't visit Ohio State again uh, in official capacity since he already did. Uh, here he took his official visit, but I mean, I, at this point, we're two weeks away. I I'm going to have him in as well for a lot of the same reasons you said a guy I have out is Christian Miller. I it's been, it's been one of those back and forth recruitments where he's sort of a, he's sort of a game player. And also, like you said, he, he does legitimately seem torn between Ohio state and Georgia. He recently took an uh, official visit to Oregon. I think he was planning a visit to Florida A&M or maybe he already took it. And uh, you're supposed to be taking a midweek to Florida A&M and, and, and a trip to, I think, Miami, also in the works for an official visit down there. And you see that sort of cycle, right? He, he was talking to Mario Cristobal at Oregon. Now he's talking to Mario Cristobal at Miami. He was talking to Dan Lanning at Georgia. Now he's taking the official visit to Oregon. It's just this constant back and forth that is college football. And he is the epitome of it, as you said. I mean, back and forth, back and forth for the last nine months. Uh, I have a RPM, you know, recruiting prediction machine selection in for Christian Miller to Ohio State. I probably should change it, but something just tells me I not to. And so I'm going to right now say I think he's still going to surprise everyone and pick the buckets. So I still have a bone to pick with you. and I forgot to bring this up before, so I'll do it pick in it. front of God and everybody in our talking stuff presented by our Buyers Auto audience. You, I remember we had an inner out with Carson Hensman, where it was you and me. And we both talked about Carson Hensman out. We both think he's going to pick Wisconsin. And two days later, Berm, I see your RPM prediction is Ohio State for Carson Hensman. I saw that because me and Spencer were talking about it. I was like, that mother, like he, he okay. Do I, I put it in there. because I saw Carson Hensman in the in the lobby of the hotel, and he told me he was committed to Ohio State. I had no choice but to put it in at that point. I mean, that, that was, it. was it, I don't think it was that. I don't think it was when you're down in, in San Antonio, when you made it, are you, sh are you sure? I can check the date on. No, that. I mean, I, maybe I had it in. I, I, I always thought that yeah, as soon as I brought up, well, there are receipts. You're like, Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe, uh, I mean, maybe there are, I don't know. I, I thought that, you know, we were pretty clear for months. I, the longer it went, you, you seemed pretty obvious that there was a, it looked like Carson Hensman was looking for a reason to not go to Ohio state. And then he got the, the reason 
to go to Ohio State when Wisconsin's offensive line coach left. And then all of a sudden, Greg Shadrar gets fired. And so then you're like, oh, gosh, what's happening? Jeff Fry made a great first impression on Carson and his family last weekend. Oh, by the way, I mean, we're going to continue to talk stuff presented by Byers Auto. Um, he, he was, you know, uh, at Carson school and got to see him work out and walk play basketball and made a good first impression. Now Carson's out in Hawaii doing the Polynesian Bowl. So he's getting a little break from all this uh, and getting some warm weather. So um, kudos to him. I think he's in. I don't think any any drama will happen with Carson Hinsman. Um, and uh, so really between now and, and February 2nd, we're looking at Carson Hinsman signing, Omari Abor signing, and then Christian Miller up in the air, right? Yep. And so first off, December 9th, is when you made that prediction, that Ohio State mm-hmm. RPM prediction for Carson Hensman. So you duped me, but uh, I I don't think that there's any drama. I'm I'm with you there for Carson Hensman's signature. I think the 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 best anecdote that happened during the All American Bowl was you took a video interview of Carson Hensman, and he's just like mid question. He's talking about because he had just learned that Greg Sadrawa was fired, and they had a really good relationship. And he's like mid interview, and he's just like. He's like, yep, there's Devin Brown, 50-yard bomb there. Like, that's like watching a spaceship take off for the first time. He's like, I run a triple option offense yeah. in Wisconsin. That that kind of, like, perfectly encapsulated why he did choose Ohio State. As hard as it was for him to, to go against Wisconsin and not stay home, it's that opportunity to kind of push yourself and get out of your comfort zone and to be with a bunch of other five stars and high, high-end four stars and pursue a national championship and, and get developed. Uh, for the NFL, not that you can't do that at Wisconsin, but it's a little bit different of a story as far as the type of talent you're surrounded by. Um, and w- with uh, yeah, with, the, with that finish, that's what I was going to mention is Ohio State's class to me in 2022. Like it was number four, it was going to finish top five with 18 guys, and it was really it was solid. It was really good, and then they went three for three at the end. I mean, Christian Miller, I, I think he's He's not as big of a priority because of how they've now filled the defensive line. But like you said, they got Hero Canoe, they got Amari Abor, assuming he signs, and they get Carson Hensman. So they finished it three for three, and they went from solid to terrific. Even yeah. though, I mean, relatively speaking, when you compare it to the 2021 class, which is, one, like I said earlier, one of the highest ranked, I think the highest ranked class in Ohio State history. When you compare yeah. it to that, sure. It's disappointing. It's it's disappointing with not getting Xavier Wampa, Zion Branch, Keontae Goodwin, some of the other offensive linemen. And I said this during the instant reaction uh, podcast during the early signing periods. Yeah, it's it's disappointing for you didn't for he didn't bring in, but now they've kind of supplemented that and and really finished this with a bang. I think. Yeah, and Christian Miller essentially, as you said, I mean, it's not that he's not a priority. It's that at this point he's sort of the cherry on top. If you if you end up finding a way to pull that coup off, uh, it's just another feather in the cap for Larry Johnson and and a player that ultimately, this is going to sound crazy. Am I crazy? Um, the, the guys that make the difference at Ohio State are people like Christian Miller, who that's a guy who's Ohio State or Georgia. And if you watch the national championship game, if you watch the college football playoff, the difference is the Georgia defensive lineman. It is the guys who are six foot four, 300 pounds and move like they do. And uh, you talk about Christian Miller. That's a player that by the time he's making an impact in college is going to be six foot four, 315, 320 pounds. And he, he's a, a, a motor guy. Like you, it, to me, you put him alongside Caden Curry and you have those sort of motors, different styles of player, but that kind of motor along with Jack Sawyer and JT to him below out. Now all of a sudden you have just some nasty guys uh, playing up front and, and I think that's what you need to compete uh, in the national landscape and to win national championships. So it's like on one hand, there's Christian Miller that it feels like if you don't get him, it's not a big deal. But if you do get him, it is a, a difference maker for the class in a way that I don't think we've really given enough credence to because we've never really expected it to happen. Uh, and, and so now here you are with two weeks to go. We'll talk more about Christian Miller next week on, on next week's episode of Talking Stuff. Uh, I'm heading down to Florida for a big uh, battle seven on seven tournament this weekend. 40 teams playing in South Florida. Um, Going to see a lot of kids down there. So hopefully we'll have some more stuff to talk. Yep. Real quick before you sign off, give us two or three names that you're most looking forward to seeing down there when you go down to Miami. Well, I know that Kyler Casper from Arizona and the, two, the Tucson Turf team is heading to Miami for that event. So I'm excited to see Kyler again. He was last year seeing him uh, in New Orleans and in Phoenix at seven on seven stuff was 
one of those surprise players for me. I was like, wow, I cannot believe how good this kid is. Then he got hurt in, uh, in the battle seven on seven tournament in New Orleans and had to sit out. So I'm excited to see him. He, Georgia just offered him on Tuesday. Ohio State's offered uh, Cedric Baxter, a running back from Edgewater. If he shows up down there, uh, he said that he's supposed to, but then he has a team banquet that he may not be able to skip. So if he's there, he's the other one. And then, of course, I'm hoping to really see uh, the young 2024 receivers down in that area, JoJo Trader uh, and uh, Jeremiah Smith uh, from the Miami area. Jeremiah Smith is, is just one of these dudes who's just a he, – he's, he's like a dude. He's a guy that Ohio State would take a commitment from today. Uh, and that's not, that's not easily said in the class of 2024 – and especially at wide receiver where Brian Hartline has, you know, his pick of the litter. So I'm also excited to see Brandon Ennis. I, I hear all about how great Brandon Ennis is. Um, and and I, I liked what I saw at him from Ohio at the Ohio State camp last June. But I don't know that he was really going full speed ahead then because he had already had it in his mind. He was committing to Oklahoma. And I think he was just kind of going through some motions. But you saw the natural skills. And I'm excited to see him in a competitive uh, environment. Can you say can you say the school Jeremiah Smith is from real quick for me? No. Oh no. Is Shamanat? No, he's at Champan, 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 Champanat. Shamanat Madonna. Shamanat Madonna. That was that was one of my favorite. Really it's like a, it's was like one of like my the, favorite podcast moments all year was our reaction on signing day. You just go, you know, yeah, Kenya Jackson Jr. from Shamanat Madonna. And then Austin just like turns and looks at me. He's like, did you just yeah. say that? Like, what, yeah. what so, the hell was that? Obviously, the Buckeyes have the in there at Shamana Madonna with uh, Kenyatta Jackson, with Ryan Turner. I'm also going to try to figure out a way to, to meet up with Kenyatta this weekend to see if I can get uh, some reaction to him. He's been hard to connect with as far as the, the stuff goes. So a lot more of that coming. Uh, you and I will talk about that uh, when I get back uh, early next week. So um, that's that, Carpenter. I'm Jeremy Birmingham. This has been Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by Buyers Auto. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you next time.